Hello and welcome to the Leesburg Public Library. I'm Sarah Walker, a library assistant in programs here. Today you're going to watch a session in our Master Gardener series with UFIFAS Extension. You will learn about container gardening in Central Florida, which can be both challenging and rewarding. So I hope you enjoy. Now, I'm Leslie Lightborn. I'm a Master Gardener here in Lake County. And I've been a Master Gardener here for about 10 years and five years associated with that university in Louisiana called LSU. And I was a master gardener there for five years as well. And uh, one of the things that we do is outreach and providing information around the state. And the libraries have been wonderful in cooperating with us and doing so, so that we could bring this information to you. Um, and our, the things that we share are things based on the research from University of Florida and from the faculty there. So in the, I have, I'm old, so I have a lot of experience in gardens, but we do pri primarily basis on the research that we know from the universities. Uh, so that's what we're about. And this is a, one of my favorite topics to talk about, the container gardening. So without further ado, we'll get started. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the Extension Office. Um, we have many different programs there, the 4-H, which we work with as well as Master Gardeners, the commercial extension agent, they're the ones that work with the landscapers, provide the training for them on uh, how they can do best practices, and also we have the uh, residential one, that, um, the residential, the livestock, and also the home one where they teach cooking. It's great. You get to eat when you go to her programs. You get to eat stuff that you fix, the consumer science as well. So they provide education um, in all those different areas. And the interesting thing I think to note is that this was established in 1914 with the Smith Lever Act, which um, established in every state a connection between the land-grant universities and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to make sure that they can get the information out to the public. But even before that, in Tuskegee was the first extension agent, and they actually traveled around Alabama with an ox-drawn cart. We don't have to do that anymore, but um, we travel all over to provide information, and we have agents in every single one of the counties. So it's a wonderful resource. Our program here, we actually have the Discovery Gardens over on Highway 19, um, heading down toward Howie in the Hills. Who all's been to the Discovery Gardens? Excellent. Who's been to our, dis our plant sale in March? Anybody? Yeah. We have a plant sale that we do in March. We grow all the plants for that and sell them at really good prices, making sure that they're plants that will grow well in your yards and easily for you. Um, and then we also do all the different programs as well. But the gardens are open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, and also on every third Saturday, open to the public. And we now have a self-guided tour that you can do as well, where you can take your phone, do the QR code, and um, that's new. So if you haven't been there, you need to come. And they're gorgeous right now. They're looking really good. So let's get into what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about container gardens and um, some of the advantages of doing that, which I'm sure many of you already know, but how best to choose the containers and then how to, how to plant them, but the planting, watering, fertilizing, maintenance of the plants, and then the real fun part is some of the plants and designing that you can do for the containers. So first of all, we know that you can make your plants e more easily accessible. You can raise them up if you have issues with bending over. You can uh, put them in different locations around your house and your yard. Um, and if you have limited space, you can have a full garden just in a really small location. When my niece moved out to San Diego, California, she was really upset at first. And I said, well, just do your garden on your stoop when you go out. So she talked to the uh, uh, the person that she was renting for, and he says, great, she had a full vegetable garden just on her stoop with planters that she did. So you can do it in a very limited space. You don't need a lot. And then you can do something like add some pop, some color to different areas, both in your landscape and in your house and your yard. Some of the other advantages are, let's say weather, like if we get a storm, and they say we're supposed to have a lot more storms this year, 
One of the things that I do with my larger plants, especially, is I go down and I go out and I lay them down so that they're, I tip them over before the storm tips them over. And sometimes I'll move them to a more protected area so that I can protect those plants. And in the winter, if we really didn't have a frost this year, but if we did, you can easily cover those plants that are in a, uh, that might be in danger from the frost. The other thing is, you know, in case you didn't know, we have really sandy soil. And there's some, most, there are a lot of plants that like sandy soil, but there's some that want a richer soil. So you can control that better within a pot. You can enrich it easier than you can out in the sand. You can move them around. To my husband's chagrin, I often go, I think that big pot would look better over there. <laughs> so, but easily to move around as you said. And one of the things that I have found is that like during the year, there might be in the summer, that area gets that late afternoon sun, but it doesn't in the winter. So maybe I can have a plant in that location in the winter, but when summer comes, I need to move it where it can get more shade. So you kind of watch how the sun is happening and where you can move. And it's, I have weedless there. Every once in a while, you'll get a weed in a pot, but usually you can control it much easier than you can in the ground. So those are some things. So let's talk about choosing a container. Anything goes. Remember I told you all before we started how I used to wear heels. Well, I don't wear them anymore. <laughs> and um, they make great little planters for bromeliads. I know. And then um, that, those are just old drawers. I had an old cabinet, and we just took the drawers out of it, painted them, put plastic in it, and they make great planters for different things as well. So really, anything goes as far as I'm concerned. I'm always looking, I go, ooh, what can I put in that, you know? Um, but um, you want something that's not toxic, that's the first, and then you've gotta have some drainage. Like I drilled holes in the bottom of these and actually even in the shoes, some little holes within that. And then you, they've gotta be able to hold something, you know, some potting mix or whatever. Uh, so, but one of the things I did with the shoes, I should do another one of those, but I did one that I just filled with, uh, I put some Spanish moss in it, and then I just put air plants in it. So it doesn't even have any soil. So it's really kind of cool looking. So what do you think about when you're doing it? You want to look at design, like you do want something more rustic, so you can do the whiskey barrel kind of thing, or in the one on the right, you can see more of an Asian motif that goes with the door. So you can look at that, the colors that you want to use. Um, so many different things you can do with choosing a container. And suitability for the plants, so you want to make sure it's the right size uh, for those plants. And stability. Now, I'm going to tell you, the one on the right is gorgeous with that plant, but you really don't want anything probably that tall in that plant the way it is. If the wind came, that's going to blow over. So you want to look, typically you don't want anything that's more than three times the height of the pot. Okay, you can do some trees, so that's a little bit different. I'm going to talk about that, but typically that's what you're looking at for that. The other thing is choosing container. These, this is from just from on my porch, and you can see a variety of different planters that I have there. From um, the one up there on the top right, that's an antique one from my great aunt, or the owl was from um, a discount store, very inexpensive um, planter. So all different kinds, and each of these materials have pros and cons. So for example, terracotta or ceramic, can be very classic looking. It can have a range of costs from very cheap, from that little owl, to probably if I had to buy the one that my grandmother had, would be pretty expensive. Um, quality is range, and, but they can last for decades. The one on the right is probably over 100 years old. I mean, I know it's over 100 years old. Um, disadvantages, that would break if I knocked it over. So that's a disadvantage. Some of them can be heavy. Um, some of the inexpensive terracotta planters, those can be, they typically are cheaper because they've not gone through all the process that they need to really firm it up appropriately and seal it. And um, they may start flaking, if you will. So if you do have one that starts doing it, all I do is I wash it really good and then I spray it with the sealant and it'll last longer with that. Um, the other thing that, that's, um, 
good, I think, about the terracotta is it will absorb some of the water. So if you tend to overwater, that's a good pot for you because it will kind of pull out some of the water of the plant for you. Wooden is great, uh, easy do it yourself. You know, using old um, drawers and things work great. Wine boxes work super. Um, the dresser drawers, um, they can be less expensive. They will rot after time, probably, unless you really seal them well. Um, and so I've had some of those drawers from a cabinet that I've probably had for about 10 years. And because I sealed it, and I do a plastic liner in there, they've done fine. The other thing for those is you wanna make sure you've raised them off the ground. You wanna put some kind of feed in there because if they're on the ground, the wood would rot. Does that make sense? Um, metal are great, except I know this comes as a big surprise. In the summer here, metal can get really hot. <laughs> so if you have it out in the sun, you need to be really careful because it can actually burn the roots of your plants. Yeah. So uh, careful with those. But tin can, anything can, any type of metal can work really well. You can repurpose. They might rust over time, but sometimes the rust looks really cool. Um, but they can last. Just be careful with the heat and make sure that you've got some holes within it as well. Uh, the more holes, the better. Plastic. Just some of the new plastic pots are gorgeous. I mean, they're beautiful. Um, they're usually less expensive to somewhat. They're lightweight. I mean. You can even take like a five gallon pail that held bird seed and paint it, and it makes a great looking pot. We just did that at the Discovery Gardens and painted them different colors. Um, you do wanna put a hole, holes with them as well. Do know that they're gonna hold the water more, so they're not gonna leach out the water. So be careful if you're a heavy waterer, if you're a heavy waterer that you don't um, use use the plastic or be careful with that. So all those things are, are really good to think about with those different types. The fiberglass, some of those are wonderful. They're beautiful now and they look like they're classic. Some of them, the fiberglass now can look like concrete or different shapes and um, they're lighter than some of the concrete that you can get, but they're really beautiful as well and um, useful to use and they can be inexpensive or very expensive. The, sometimes the fiberglass Fibers will fray over time, but they'll last for years as well. Concrete I love, but it's really heavy. Um, I do a lot with hypertufa, which you can make yourself. Has anybody done that before with the hypertufa? You use the, uh, a, it's a mixture of concrete, peat moss, and perlite, and you mix it up, and then you put it in a shape, and then you let it dry. You water it over time. There's a whole bunch of articles about how to do it, and you can make all kinds of different shapes with that as well, and you can do it yourself. And then fabric, I've got a fabric one over here. I love these for, um, I've got my sweet potatoes and potatoes in these and a bigger one, but I use these a lot for herbs and uh, lettuces. In fact, in the summer, because lettuce won't grow here outside, I grow them in a fabric pot inside the house and I can get my own lettuce all year long. But these fabrics are great and believe it or not, you clean it, hose it off and then just throw it in the wash and you can reuse it over years. So excellent ones to use as well. And you can even use shopping bags like this. These will work just as well. A Lot of different alternatives for us. So size does matter in a pot. Um, if it's too big, if your plants, what, what is going to happen is it'll hold excess water and it can cause root rot over time. And then if the roots were going to focus on filling up the pot and you don't get as much foliage because they're going to work really hard. So you do need to be careful about that sometimes about what size plant you're putting in there. And if it's too small, then the roots don't have room and it quickly becomes root bound. They'll circle and they almost strangle the plant and they'll push out the dirt and it'll dry out really fast. So you do need to make sure you're, you're kind of making it the right one for that plant. Um, um, anything goes. Um, this was a canoe with a hole in it. So what a great use, huh? Um, these are children's toys. This was a, a little, um, the little truck and then teapots, whatever will hold the plant I think we'll use. Wall planters have now become really popular as well. Um, these, that was just boxes that were put up on the wall as well on the right. You can, these were purchased ones, but those would be easy to make out of the wood. 
The ones there on the left are painted um, and cut out um, soda bottles. Yeah, kind of cool. And then um, the one on the right is with, it's, uh, it's got a hanger, and then the pots are just hung up on the hanger as well. And then uh, most of the planters that you can use on the wall are flat on the back. It makes it easier, you know, for getting it mounted. And then you can use these, they're pot clips you can purchase that can actually hold them to a lattice. And then be careful about what you're putting it on there. You want to have it on something that you know water's not going to damage. So stucco next to the front door, fences are really good. And then these are a couple of others. We have um, no water anymore in these, but that was an old fountain that no longer works. And we have one at the Discovery Gardens that is now full of succulents, which is gorgeous. And then that's an old sink. That's actually at um, Disney that they had that as well. Isn't that cool? Neat stuff. And then the ultimate container, um, there's a house. <laughs> and um, so they use the top, and the other one is a shed where they actually did for the roof a lot. They do that a lot in Europe where they actually do their gardens right on top of the roof. And, um, and then it keeps it cooler uh, underneath. So ultimate can do that as well. So what are you going to put in there? There are a lot of the potting mixes you can use that actually don't have the soil in it anymore. Um, but you can do with soil, but you want to make sure you have a few other things in there as well. I do, I have a big pot that I mix mine up, a bucket, and I do uh, some of the potting soil that I purchase. I use sphagnum moss, uh, perlite, vermiculite, stir it up really good, and I keep that, and that's what I use for my plants and had that to use. Um, and you want, the reason for, for the perlite and vermiculite is you want to make sure that you're going to have good drainage to help prevent the root rot as well. Let's talk about watering. Potted plants are going to dry more quickly than the ones out in your soil, though I sometimes question that with our sandy soil. It seems like the water goes away really fast. Um, but you want to make sure that you, if you put different types of plants into one pot, you want ones with similar watering needs, so that if it's something that uses a, like bromeliads, and about any kind of bromeliad can go into one pot because it doesn't use a lot of water. So that's one of the things you want to do. Um, the, so I like to do what the, the knuckle test before I water my plants. I actually take and stick my finger down in the water. I look down in the knuckle. So if it's damp, if it's still damp, it's going to be dry on the top, right? Right off the bat. That's going to dry because of the heat and the air. But if it's damp at all where my finger is down in there, I'm not going to water. So I kind of test it. And I actually use a, this is a high tech thing. I actually use this. I actually stick that down in the pot and then I stick my finger down in there. So I kind of get down there, squirt it around a little bit and then I can check for water um, as well. Um, it might, depending on how much sun it gets or wind, um, some pots, especially the small, you might need to water almost every day, depending on what the plan is, or every other day in the summer, typically not in the winter, but in the summer. Um, I like to use a watering can so I can control it, but I also have the watering wand, if you will, which disperses the water a little bit instead of like a straight hose, and I can um, do it for my high plants and the low plants, so it's easier to keep for the watering as well. The other thing I do for all of my plants, all of them, is I do mulch on my pots because it reduces, it does a couple of things. One, it helps temper the temperature of the soil so that in the summer it doesn't get that hot or in the winter it doesn't get that cold. It reduces the evaporation of water so you don't have to water as much. And if you were going to get any weeds, it helps deter the weeds. So mulching. So when you're planting it, you want to make sure you leave at the top of your plant. The soil, you want you know, a couple of inches below the top of the pot. That way you can water without the water overflowing, and you've got room to put a little bit of mulch in there as well. So you always want to make sure you don't fill right up to the brim. So water for most of our plants, yes. What are you using for mulch? I actually use Flora Mulch, um, which is a brand, um, and it's, it's made of Melaleuca. 
and which y'all know about melaleuca trees? The melaleuca trees are the invasive tree that was taken over the Everglades. And so this mulch is made from those trees. And it's really good for a lot of reasons. One, first, it's helping get rid of an invasive tree. It's usually less expensive than most of the other mulches as well. It retains its color well. It's, I, I use this as well, like I go around every once in a while and I kind of stir the mulch up to keep it fluffy. It fluffs up really easily. When I use it out in the yard, I don't use this. I use a rake <laughs> but um, for my pots. But, um, and the other thing, it is, has what they call allelopathic powers, which means that it helps deter insects for the first few months, especially termites. Now, the one place you don't want to use this is if you're using seeds, because it will slow down the sprouting of the seeds, seeds as well. You want to wait till it sprouts. But it's really what we recommend, even over cypress. And the reason is a lot of our cypress, we don't know where it came from. And did it come from some tree that should be out in nature still? And this is a tree we want to get rid of. It's called Flora Mulch is the brand that I've found it. Um, but another one is a eucalyptus is another good one to use. Um, but uh, it's, it's an excellent mulch It's what I use, yeah. Uh, but also uh, straw is good. The other thing I've sometimes used, if I have a lot of Spanish moss, I'll put that around the top of the plant too, and that does fine, yes. I actually, the one place I know right now where you can get flora mulch is at Lowe's. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it's, it's F-L-O-R-I and then a dash and then mulch. And it's actually been endorsed by the uh, Save the Everglades group and the Nature Conservancy and by UF. So it, it's all one. We don't usually advertise, <laughs> but I will on that one, yeah, on that one. Great questions. Thank you all. Um, so water till the uh, water uh, leaches out. Um, that way you know that there's water all the way through the pot. So um, you can see where it's come out of the bottom of that pot. And typically you want to raise the pots. You typically, if they're right on a surface like a patio or concrete, um, it reduces the drainage. And then it also can increase, the, if it's on concrete, it can increase the heat in the pot. Okay, as well. Um, and then we already talked about the clay and wood can helps bring the water out. And there are some water holding gels that you can get that you add in with your potting soil. And if you tend to have an issue with not getting enough watering, you can do that because they'll help retain the moisture. Fertilizing. Um, there are really two different approaches you can do. One is if you do a water soluble fertilizer, which I actually use on my orchid plants. Um, those, um, it's, it's, you would use the fertilizer with your watering about every two weeks. And typically you want to water your plant and then add it with the water with the fertilizer in it as well. Um, if you're using that for bromeliads and other types of plants that aren't real feeders, they don't need a lot of fertilizer, then you want to cut what they say, the amount, the strength of the fertilizer, cut it in half because you don't really need all of that strength as well. But because the water is draining out and you're losing a lot of the, um, the fertilizer, then you would do that. Except for my orchids, I use slow release <coughs> fertilizers and that's where the fertilizers have been coated so that you, they're little pellets and they're coated and it's gonna release the fertilizer over time. So it's not getting that jolt that it can get of like the nitrogen from the water soluble and it, it, it'll last longer. So usually in early spring, I'll go around with my bag of fertilizer and I'll sprinkle <coughs> it on all my pots and then um, and that might be the only time I fertilize. Um, if something looks like it needs something, I might do it about three months later, but that's all I do. I very rarely need, you very rarely need to do it more than that. But if you do, they say do it only every few months. So even though the slow release fertilizer to begin with is typically a little bit more expensive, it's not in the end because you don't use <coughs> as much. Okay. Um, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you purchase a potting mix and you're putting the plants right in that, 
they, if they already have the fertilizer in there, you don't need to fertilize for at, at least quite a few months, four months or, or well. So you don't need to add anything. And the biggest problem that we typically have is over fertilizing because it becomes almost toxic, if you will, for the plant. And if it's a flowering plant and you over fertilize it with nitrogen, you'll end up with beautiful foliage because the nitrogen is feeding the foliage but it won't do as many flowers. So kind of watch for that one as well. And then if your plant's not looking happy, if it's looking dry or wilted, don't add fertilizer then. Wait, <coughs> water it, get a little bit healthier with the water, and then add your fertilizer. You can burn it if it's like that. Maintenance. Um, I wish I could say I do this, but not for my big pots, but they say to, you should look at it once that you can to replace the potting mix annually to go in, but mainly to pull the plant and check the roots to make sure that it's not root bound. Some of my bigger pots that I've got, I've got some you know really big ones, what I do with that is I take a mixture of compost and some potting soil and I mix, I put it to the top of the pot, and I kind of dig down so that the nutrients go down. It's really, I can't imagine having to take those, those out of there. But um, if you can, that's a good thing to do, to look to see if they're root bound. That one's looking healthy, but if it was root bound, if it was the one in the middle, you can see how there's no soil left, right? It's all roots. So you would probably want to move that into a bigger pot. You want to trim off some of those roots, kind of tease them out, loosen them, and then probably move that into a bigger pot. How many of you had that happen where you have a pot, you take the plant out, and there's no soil left? Yeah. Where did it go? Um, but um, but they, it's gone into the nutrients, into the plant with that. Any insects, so just go pick them up and then um, clean out the leaves <laughs> and the weeds are the main thing if you have any, any if dead leaves. And then, and a lot of our plants, especially your flowering ones, sometimes they like to be pinched. They like you to go by and pinch off like the middle, leave a node right there so you've still got some where the new growth is going to come out, where the leaves are coming out. That's called the node. You want to leave the node because you'll have new branches coming out of that. So just go by and pinch it off as well. I do that with my basil plants. I haven't, and then I eat it, so that's a good thing. So our biggest question, what do you plant? Look at all the things we can plant. How cool is that? So from variety, from trees to little annuals that you get, anything that you can imagine. And we're going to talk about a variety of these as well. So whatever you want, you can probably get it out of doing with the container. The first thing to know is in selecting plants, you typically want to choose things that are for our planting zone, our hardiness zone. <laughs> And our zone changed. They evaluate this every 10 years, and they did this in 2023, based on the average annual extreme minimum temperatures. So they looked at what it was over those times, and they found that like where I live, just north of Mount Dora, I moved from what they call zone 9A to 9B. Parts of Claremont have moved from, they were somewhere 9A to 9B, and there's parts of it that are zone 10. So we're getting hotter. <laughs> so um, you want to make sure, like right now, I have a lot of zone 10 plants, some 9B, and I have them in a protected area where they'll stay warm, and I don't need to worry about them, because they'll do fine here now. Um, but um, we have, our temperatures are changing, so you got to watch that on there. So um, you can actually go to the University of Florida, you type in uh, plant hardiness zone, and you can put in your zip code, and it'll tell you your exact zone. It's pretty fun to read on there. So just remember, though, that your container temperature is going to fluctuate more than the ground temperature. So, for example, if we did have a cold, that pot is going to be colder than the ground. If we had a freeze, it's going to be colder. So do keep that in mind as well. So we want to think about when we're putting different plants into the same pot, you want to think about a lot of different things like water requirements, how much light they're going to get, where you're going to position them, um, 
whether you want in your colors, like this one is what they call monochromatic, where it's more the same colors within a pot, just different green, shades of green. The textures of plants, you want to have something feathery or do you want something more tall, different shape, and then shapes and heights, and then you can use seeds, bulbs, or transplants. So for example, I have some planters that I have that have like one main plant that I keep in there, <laughs> and then, which is a perennial, and then I'll throw seeds in it periodically to get some other flowers or stuff to come up as well. So you can mix it up, it's fun to do. And I have dogs that help me. They like to knock over my planters. So often they do some pruning for me by doing that and then they tell me, you need to put another plant in here. We don't want that there anymore. They're excellent help. Um, so let's say you wanna do an ornamental planter. This is kind of classic design, but this is how they say you should kind of look at doing your planter, both small and, and large, but doing something that's a, what they call a thriller, a taller plant that's gonna give you some vertical interest like the grass that we have. Um, fillers are gonna be your plants that are gonna fill in that area, that they're gonna cover the, the soil, and so therefore you're not gonna have any issues with weeds or anything getting in there. And then a spiller softens the edge of the plant planter and it'll cascade over the side. So we'll look at a different one. Here is one that we did that Brooke Moffis, who was our former uh, home and garden, extension agent, but now is our commercial agent. This is one she did, and so she did a Dracaena as the thriller. It's giving you that color, that large shape, that height. She did a Coleus to go around the, to fill in, and then a Portaluca to come over the sides of the plant. Kind of a cool combination, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, here's another one. This was on her front porch. As you can see, the sweet potato vine took over and had to be trimmed, but you can always make new plants with sweet potato. But you've got a grass, the Penistrum rubrum, which is that beautiful purple one, and then Persian Shield, one of my favorites, uh, which has that kind of glimmer of purple and sheen, kind of a shiny kind of color as well. But what a uh, eye popper huh, of, a, of a garden. And once she plant it, she didn't do anything. That's it. You just leave it, except cut back the sweet potato vine. <laughs> that was it. Some other design concepts to think about are color theory and grouping. Now y'all probably remember this. You remember the, the color wheel? Yeah. So we can use that when we're thinking about plants. Monochromatic, analogous, and complementary are the three main things I'm gonna talk about. So monochromatic is more soothing to the eye. It's where you tend to stay with the same colors. So this one you can see, it's got the violet, the calabrachia, and it, it's, it just has that nice calming kind of look. Analogous is gonna be more dramatic. And that, when you look at the color wheel, they're the closely related colors, like the orange and the yellows are next to each other. But those are gonna pop, they're gonna catch your eyes. So like, or uh, orange and red together, or blues and greens, all of those would be analogous. But very dramatic and eye-catching as well. And again, you can see the thriller, filler, <coughs> spiller there, dramatic, uh, complementary, demand attention. They're from the opposite sides of the color spectrum, and they're where you're gonna really get something that catches your attention. And y'all might note this one, and maybe now you know why University of Florida picked these colors for their, so I mean, talk about something capturing your eye, right? So, um, wonderful ways to think about it. Then the other thing is neutral colors. Those are where you can add those to the others, your whites, your blacks, your grays. That can break up or soothe if you've got some contrasting just to break it up a little bit. And then adding foliage. Kind of what the rule of thumb is, is one foliage plant to three flowering if you're doing one of the larger pots as well. Kind of fun to look at, isn't it? The other thing is sometimes you want to just do grouping of pots, like this is kind of a triangle shape with different pots with similar needs or the rectangle that they have. And the one in the middle that I think is interesting is they're all the same material but different sizes. And then the trapezoid is kind of looking at your shape that you do with your pots. This was actually from um, Epcot. And then grouping with color harmony. So you've got different pots that want to be by themselves. They don't necessarily want to be in another pot with others, but you can put them 
Um, so you, you group by your different colors with your pots. I like to do this because I like to move the pots around and see what they look like on there as well. Kind of fun to do. And then grouping by repetition. This is one where it has the, the same shape, different color pots, but the same plant. But the different colors of the pots give you a good look. And then grouping varied size. Same pot, different sizes, different plants that you can with the colors. So let's look at some more plants. Cool things. And one of the things that do really well are fruit trees. And this is a really great article that's at the EDIS, which is on that sheet that you had, the, um, the yellow sheet that I gave you. It ha but if you just type in University of Florida growing fruit crops in containers, this will pop up. It gives you everything you need to know about doing it. But it talks about doing fig trees, limes, lemons, avocados, which can get really large in your landscape, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries. All those things are different things that grow well here in pots, which you can do. Uh, so uh, kumquat is another lovely one that does. And then the lemon trees. And there's some dwarf ones now, the lemon dwarfs, that grow very well in your pots uh, that you can do. Um, do note, I'm going to give a caveat on here. I, got, I just got this question. They had a lemon tree in their lanai, which is screen, and they got the flowers, but they got no fruit because they didn't get pollinated. So I said, and if you, you're gonna have to pollinate it yourself, you're gonna have to go from flower to flower, or you need to move it so it can get some insects, yeah. You can be a little bee and run around. Um, growing vegetables, did, did y'all ever try that? Those were real popular a long time ago. I had the pot you do upside down. I actually did a cooler and drilled a hole in the bottom and then just hung it up like a water cooler. And I grew my tomato plants. It was great, especially the Sweet 100, just produced forever. Um, but and then just hung it out there so that it could do um, kind of a fun thing to do. But vegetables grow great in containers here as well. Um, and you can do all different. One of the things I know is like the depth of it, you want to make sure that you've got um, deep enough for the roots that you're going to get. So for the carrots that you've got, tomato plants want a lot of depth for theirs. They don't need really wide, but they want a depth for their roots that you do as well. Uh, lettuces you can grow in almost anything. A dish pan does great for those. Or a shoebox, line a shoebox with some foil and throw the lettuce seeds in there, and it'll do fine. Swiss chard, another one for that. So vegetables are going to need about 8 to, out to 10 hours of sunlight, though, uh, to grow. And typically, you want to use more of your bush type or dwarf varieties, or you need a bigger pot. That makes sense. And then the wider the pot is probably better for those as well. Um, but you also, for an indeterminate tomato plant, which means that it keeps growing and the tomatoes grow out at the end of the stems, um, you can add a trellis and do that for those or for vining or taller plants. Last year, I did my peas in a pot <laughs> and I just had a trellis on there and we had them almost all winter in the pot. Yeah, pretty cool. Fresh peas, yum, yum. <laughs> Herbs and spices too, wonderful thing to add as well. This is a really good article as well, the publication in EDIS uh, that tells you the different ones. And the cool things about these is that for example, if you've got a windowsill in your kitchen, you can just put your herbs right there in the windowsill. So you can just cut them right there. But um, variety that they do, the sage, the parsley, and, and again, parsley's not gonna grow here in the summer, but you can grow it inside if you have a pot to do as well. Cilantro, culantro, all of those grow very well here as well. I do. Ornamental grasses are another thing that we highly recommend. Um, and the cool thing about those, I think, is all the different colors that you can get and heights. They're both dwarf to height. Um, the, um, the, the, I found, though, I'm going to say the muley grasses are a little bit more difficult to grow in pots. And I'm wondering if it's not because they really like sandy soil. So I have an experiment I've started where they're pretty much planted in a pot with just sandy soil. And I'll, I'll let y'all know how that one does. But you can see the variety that you can look at for the heights and the colors as well with ornamentals. 
And then here comes my favorite, caladiums. I love caladiums. They just, and they're popping out all over right now, but you can mix them with other plants. They do great in window boxes, or there's some that'll get really big. You can put in the pots and um, they, they really thrive here, out in our landscape, but also in pots as well. And they're very uh, tolerant of, uh, of drought, so that if you forget to water, they're gonna last longer. They're more tolerant, yeah. They don't like overwatering, though. They, it matters. Some of them are now bred to, to tolerate more sun. So you wanna make sure which it is that you use. But yes, you can do with the sun. Typically, I think it's the one with that deeper red tend to do better in the sun. Mm -hmm. Pintas and calabroke are two of my favorites, attracting the butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, but the colors that you can get, the diversity, and they grow very complementary well together. Um, so excellent ones that we have. Um, another one, Diffenbachia. Who'd have thought? But look at that with the impatience. Yeah, very similar in water needs, um, and they grow very well together. This is another easy peasy one, African daisy. And notice I repeated the calabrachia. That is one of the easiest things to grow here. Um, they're, they're easier than petunias, but they kind of have that same kind of feel as a petunia. They'll last longer. They can grow through the summer here, which the petunias won't. So. That's kind of where I move toward those. But African daisy is another gorgeous one that will attract both your bees and your, um, and your butterflies. And then this is from Brooke as well, but that's showing you the one where that's a supertunia up there on your left, which again was gorgeous, but once the heat hits, it's done. Where the one on the right has that beautiful deep mil million bells blooms nonstop through the summer and the fall and sometimes through the winter as well. Yeah, really great plants. And they have, I've checked different stores, they have them right now, so they're good. This is another cool one that was a wall one with a whirling butterfly or guara and then calabrachia and then that sweet potato vines back. Um, and that one is called margarita, isn't it cool? So it's got that bright green color as well. Easy, easy, easy. Um, and then this is one of my favorites that I do, the succulents. Um, really into those these days, but you can, variety of colors and shapes, um, they take very little care, very little care. And the main thing is don't use real rich soil. You really wanna use a lot of sand in your potting soil for these. They do not like that. And they don't really like fertilizer either. And they don't like water. <laughs> they, li they like to be left alone. If you want to kill them, overwater them. Yeah, but they, yeah, they're great, great plants for that. Easy peasy. Um, some of the things you can look at too is doing some theme gardens. So this is a butterfly one where you've got both the adult food with the blue salvia and uh, pintas and then adding echinacea and mints can add for those. And then the host plants or the larval food for your uh, caterpillars. And yes, the caterpillars are gonna eat those plants. You will, you will lose those leaves, that's what they do, but the plants will come back, do not fear. But if you want your butterflies, you have to feed your caterpillars. But um, blue salvia is double dips. It's both an adult food and a host. Uh, parsley's a great one for that as well. Dill and fennel. For example, I hate the taste of fennel, but I grow it for my butterflies. So it's a good thing to do. I like dill and the other stuff. The penta actually will draw in your sphinx moth as well, which is the cool moth that looks kind of like a hummingbird. Yeah, so um, neat ones to do with the penta. This one is a themed salsa garden. So it's got everything you need to make your salsa. Kind of a cool thing to do. You could do the same thing for uh, a spaghetti sauce garden. You could do as well. Kind of fun to think of putting those together. Here's a themed fairy garden as well. Different designs you can in and add in. You know, you can go pretty crazy with containers, yeah. And then uh, beach gardens, if you will. Yep, another good theme with that, little boats. And then seasonal colors are fun to look at as well. 
So you can switch them out or just add, remember how I said sometimes I add seeds different times or some annuals in there? Sometimes I'll have my foliage plant that stays all the time, but I'll switch out some of the others according to the season as well. And then poinsettia obviously is a great container plant and you can keep it alive through the year, but you also can plant it out in your yard. I love mine out in my yard as well. So this is, um, this is here, it was in Mount Dora, a backyard, um, and the possibilities are endless. You think this person likes pots? <laughs> uh, isn't that cool? Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah, and the reason they did that is there was a really ugly fence and building behind, and they did this. So you really, your eye goes to this. You don't look beyond as well. And what fun to wander around in there. I'm going to show you some resources and then we probably have some time for a few questions. This is an excellent book. Pamela Crawford used to be here in Florida and was a, a master gardener and she wrote a book that we put out from UF. I was going to bring it but I loaned it to somebody. <laughs> so, um, but there's an older version, the container garden, and she's come out with a new one. But you can even find the older version online sometimes used as well but it is an excellent excellent resource and she allowed for me to use some of her pictures in this PowerPoint if you didn't know um, and then these are different resources that we recommend as well both from the Edis IFAS um, which is straight from the University of Florida but also a program that we call gardening solutions which has topics about different things for home gardeners and there's both the ornamentals and the growing vegetables in containers. So excellent resources that we've got there for y'all. So the Lake County Extension Office is over on Highway, off of Highway 19, heading toward Howie and the Hills on Woodley Road. And it, the extensions were actually started in 1914 by the federal government and it was to have connectedness between the universities, the land-grant universities, and the communities so that information could go out from the universities to the communities. So pretty much most of what we do is free for the public. We do, luckily enough, we have the Discovery Gardens there, which was started back in 1994 by a group of landscapers and uh, concerned citizens, master gardeners, University of Florida, and the Lake County Commissioners. And they decided we needed a garden to be able to show people who moved to the area especially, how do you garden here in Florida? So we have 24 different gardens, and then we have a, a compost demonstration, uh, a, a butterfly gardens, tropical gardens, vegetable gardens, a greenhouse, a orchid house, also rain gardens, but any kind of garden you can think of um, so that you can go and learn about how to garden here in Lake County. I have a lot of time. My house needs work. I would love to plant more beautiful flowers and make it stand out more. Um, vegetables is something I really want to do because, you know, you want to be able to provide to, for your family. So growing vegetables and fruits, that would be pretty cool. So um, that's what I'm hoping for. So I, I got a lot of information this, today, so it was useful. So it's kind of a win-win. I'm winning right now. I'm just winning. And I have this gardenias are my favorite plant so the fact that someone brought it up and of uh, uh, the other people are in the same problems we're in florida and it's burning here but um i know what to do to help my plant thrive <laughs> we hope you enjoyed today's master gardener program this is a monthly series so if you're interested in gardening in central florida you may want to know more about the programming we provide you can go to www.leesburgflorida.gov slash library to see our events calendar for this kind of programming as well as others like cooking, writing, book clubs, technology classes, and a lot more. If you would like any more information than that, please give us a call at 352-728-9790, option 3, and we hope to see you here soon.